Okay. <clears throat> um, there are a few more people joining, but um, but I think we'll uh, we'll get started. So, uh, yeah, morning, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. Um, we uh, we're here. Um, uh, I'm guessing uh, you're here as well. The, the title of the, the the talk or the conversation didn't offend you, um, and it really shouldn't, because uh, we're here today to to get a better uh, understanding of uh, of our customers. Um, and how better to communicate with them and uh, give them exactly what it is they need or what they're looking for. Uh, so for starters, um, I'll give you an uh, intro to myself. Um, I'm Gavin Lojny, I'm Head of Strategy and Insight at uh, Dot Digital, and I've been working in uh, digital marketing for around 17 years or so, and I'm a bit of a self-confessed uh, data geek. Um, for those of you who don't know Dot Digital, we're a, a marketing solution um, for um, B2B, um, B2C, NFP marketers, um, and speed and ease of use are at the core of our, our product. Um, and omni-channel is, is everything we sort of live and breathe. So we're here to help um, our customers achieve their goals faster. Um, and to help you do that, we've got a number of widgets uh, to help you manage your data and engage with your customers on whatever channel um, is their favorite, whether that's uh, email, SMS, push, live chat, and, uh, and social ads. Um, but I'm not here by myself today. I'm, uh, I'm joined by Andreas. So uh, Andreas, do you want to join us? Hey, hi, Gavin. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. Yeah, so um, I'm Andres Poros. I am CEO and co-founder of an agency called Greenlight Digital, and we focus on uh, predominantly kind of performance marketing, driving uh, revenue ROI to lots of businesses. Um, our clients include people like you know, RB, Pfizer, Dixon, Carphone, and what we're typically engaged to do is really challenge our clients in terms of their performance in digital. And a big part of that is focusing on their customer and where they understand their customer and where they really are truly targeting their customers in the most effective way. And so as kind of to reiterate with what Gavin said from the outset, the real purpose of this webinar is to challenge you all um, because there'll be some of you sitting there that think you really do know your customer. And our job today is to basically try and um, <laughs> find a chink in your armor um, to make you actually readdress whether you do and employ different tactics and be more ambitious about doing it because yeah. you know, it's a highly highly competitive environment out there and one of the ways in which you can gain more competitive advantage is knowing your customer better than your competitors do. yeah Indeed. i think that we, did a, we did a little survey didn't we, i think just to see whether yeah yeah, so we um, and some, you know, some of you sorted it out, and thank you for the ones who did. Um, so uh, we did ask uh, uh, you guys how well you know your customers, and Andreas already said if we're, we're looking for that chink in the armor to see if uh, people really do know their customers or not. Um, well, well, it's a very short webinar. If everyone says ten out of ten, <laughs> well, we did have some people who said uh, they know them uh, inside out, um, and some people um, was said you know they don't really know their customers at all. Um, but the average score we had was uh, was 5.9. So if you remember, the the score was one. You don't know them at all. To to 10, you know them inside and out. So 5.9, six. You know, that's it. That's uh, the. Do you think that's a reasonable score, or is that over and above what you're thinking? I think I think you know, averages are averages, right? You're a data guy. You know that averages mean nothing at all. Because um, there be some people <laughs> that that are, ten, that are saying 10 out of 10, when in reality yeah. they know zero. There'll be some people out there who are getting sort of a hard time and said three out of 10, when actually they, they might even be best in class. Just don't know. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly, yeah. So those are the averages. Um, other bits of data we asked as, as well were um, whether you, you guys are B2B or B2C. Um, it's pretty much an even split on that. But what we didn't ask was uh, whether you were other, um, and that might be NFP or something else. So if you are, you know, you do sit in a, in a different bracket, um, let us know. Um, uh, again, with all this data as well, surprising that um, uh, average team size was 17. And again, you, you've already said that, Andreas, you know, averages are, you know, just kind of throw, throw us off the, the track completely. But what was more uh, in in line with what we believe is there was 16% of, of registrants uh, said that they work in a team of, of three or, or less. Um, 
so that 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 is sort of probably more in line it's probably more more than that right um but those are those are the kind of uh, figures we were looking at and that's the the sort of data we want to we want to kind of address today because essentially uh, we want to kind of tackle um, the difference between customer data versus customer insight. And you've probably got something to, to say there on that, Andreas. Yeah, I think I think it's important from the outset to kind of define these two things because they are very, very different. And again, we asked a question through the survey, what were people really answering? Were they answering whether they had customer data or whether they had sufficient customer insights? The, mm -hmm. the real difference between them, the, the important difference is that customer data is that you know, is those factual obvious bits of things that you know about your customers and whether they transacted with you what they bought where they live those kind of things customer insights are more about the non-obvious things things that actually you probably don't know without doing some degree of heavy lifting about your customers mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it's about looking for patterns and looking for um, things in the data that allow you to make marketing decisions that are non-obvious because the insight is non-obvious. And I, I'd, I'd, I'd hazard the guess that most people have got lots and lots of good customer data, but quite limited customer insight. And we can demonstrate that, I think, throughout this webinar. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of sort of lateral thinking as well. Um, one, I, I guess one of the key things I want to do here is uh, we've got a Q&A session at the end um, and, you know, we'd love to get um, questions from from everyone sort of listening in, but um, you can do that all the way through. So you should have the uh, little um, option to uh, ask us questions all the way through and we'll we'll get around to that. So is there anything that comes up in, uh, in today that... Um, you're sort of uh, questioning, then obviously send us uh, send those through those those questions, and we'll answer those, or we'll try to. Um, so um, it kind of breaks down into these three areas, right? Customer data versus customer insight. You've got the basics, the data science, and the and the testing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, for, the, for the purposes of a one-hour webinar, it would do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got to condense it somehow, right? It's a huge topic. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so we'll, we'll cover these three areas and uh, let's just get straight into it, the, the basics. Um, so uh, away you go. Yeah. So, so the first thing around the basics and what people often kind of get wrong and what we, we see a lot of within kind of our clients and prospective clients is um, confusing the purchaser with the consumer. So yeah. these two are really good examples. So the first one there, 60% of people searching for baby clothes don't have kids at home and aren't expecting. So that's 60% of people looking for baby, baby clothes are you know, grandparents or uncles, aunties, godparents, that kind of thing. And then looking at some yeah. of my clients specifically, those people also spend more than parents do. Uh, yeah. You know, so whereas you, know, you might be happy to have your you know, your kid head to toe in you know some discount where you know, people giving you gifts probably spend a bit more on those things. So not only is it a case that the majority of people looking for baby clothes um, don't actually have kids uh, at home and aren't expecting. It's more because they probably spend more too. And that's really important because you know, even with a basic example, if you're doing Facebook advertising, you need to stipulate who you're targeting. So you know, one of the things that you do is put an age range. So you, know, you can see someone that sells baby clothes uh, restricting the age range to people that are of childbearing years as opposed yeah. to actually the older demographic yeah. probably spend more, probably convert faster. So yeah. again, it's confusing the purchase and the consumer. We see it all the time. Another example yeah. there, 50% of all beard oil buyers are women, and that's not women with beards. Um, I don't think it has anything to guess at that. So you know, we, see that, we see that a lot, this confusing the purchaser and the consumer. Another, another really good example um, is that uh, people often have businesses where they're targeting high net worth individuals. So they do their targeting to only hit people who have who met certain criteria, which suggests that they're super, super wealthy. Yeah. However, lots of these people who are super wealthy don't make certain buying decisions. Their PAs yeah. do, or their managers do, who earn infinitely exactly. less. Right? Yeah. It's, it's so like some sort of data prejudice, right? You know, you just, you're just kind of looking at it face value. And, and I guess this is what it's all about, right? Yeah, I think so. I think the, your, um, kind of the next couple of examples kind of support that too yeah. because the examples around um, making assumptions and marketers mm -hmm. make lots of assumptions and sometimes they have to now the real answer is you make an assumption you test it but often assumptions go unchallenged and untested so a good example yeah. is those with annual earnings of more than 150 grand are 32 percent more likely to visit easyjet 
Now, some of us know that through you know, booking business travel and whatnot, but you know, that isn't what a lot of people would automatically assume. So again, you know, armed with that insight, what are you doing in terms of targeting and you know, are you then segmenting audiences in different ways to target different groups, knowing that this is a significant group? Another example mm -hmm. down the bottom left is you know, a woman spent 73 days and interacted with more than 250 touch points before purchasing a single pair of jeans. Now, that sounds ridiculous to us because we've been conditioned to think of things happening within a 30-day cookie window. So every yeah. single thing is within 30 days, but people don't all um, sit within the 30-day action bracket because Gavin needs to write a report. Um, exactly. Right, so, so again, you've got to be careful about what assumptions you're making about people and not putting people mm -hmm. in, 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 in very, very big, broad buckets of behavior. Um, because again, yeah. Whilst this person has only um, bought a single pair of jeans, that, that, that kind of behavior probably suggests that she's going to be loyal to the brand that she's buying from because she's taken so long to choose a brand, perhaps, right? So you just don't know. Mm -hmm. assumptions, are, assumptions are really dangerous. Yeah, I mean, what, what I uh, sort of picked up when I looked at this in particular was, um, you know, the aspect of procrastination. Um, and... And is this a direct um, correlation with uh, people buying online as well? You know, um, if, if you're buying online, you can't pick up, you can't feel, you can't touch, um, you can't make that sort of split decision. Um, so, so maybe that's, um, that's part of the issue. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know. I, yeah I, I think so. Certainly offline, people are more likely uh, to go, you know, let's say they're going shopping to the West End uh, and they spend the whole day out and about looking at things. It's quite rare for them to then feel happy about coming home empty handed. Um, exactly. Whereas online, there's no kind of implication to that. And look, that, that woman is clearly an extreme example, but just kind of demonstrates that you know, people convert anything between zero and 100 days. And mm -hmm. some of the ways in which we've always measured things really need to be challenged because, again, we can't treat people in exactly the same way. We know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then we got these as well. Yeah, so th these are examples of you know, a basic problem we see where people just don't go into enough detail into their data to really understand what's going on. And often it's a time and resource thing, but again, often the data is there, it's just it needs more time to you know, go through and work through. So a good yeah. example is you know, looking at a, a particular channel in particular, um, you know, the misspelled term roulette costs more than roulette in Google ads. Um, and then there's, you know, we can debate why that is. Um, you know, some people think, or most people think, it's because people that misspell roulette have a lower IQ and, and, and gamble more. But that's, I, don't think that, I don't think that's true. I don't think, you know, in my experience, that's true either. You know, lots, of the, lots of the most disruptive gamblers I know uh, are very, very intelligent people. I'm not sure that's the answer. I'm more inclined yeah. to the answer is that if you're if you're misspelling roulette, it means that you're less familiar with the word roulette. I haven't seen it so much because you're not a hardened roulette player, and therefore you're more likely to be a brand new roulette player, and therefore are more valuable to people because mm. you're less likely to be shopping around for free spins and that kind of thing. Um, but then again, those are those are still assumptions, right? So we, we still so, have I mean, to I, we I have to let the data take a course. My own my own rules. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> that's exactly right and again you know but you can test these things um but you have to know what to test before you can test yeah. it exactly and the last example and we'll, there, we'll get last to test in later right exactly and the last example there is not about going deep into a channel but making sure you're looking broadly across different kinds of channels um so mm -hmm. in this example younger affluent consumers notice out of home advertising the most um and they that may not be true for every single brand, but if you've not tested all the different channels, then how do you know? So do you exactly. have that data? Have you tested enough things to have the data to then go, actually, the, these two channels are amazing for us versus X, Y, Z? Yeah, yeah, I love that as well, because I mean, one of our key things is that we are we are omni-channel and, um, you know, engaging with people on different channels is what you need to be doing to, to keep them stickier. So do, do your testing and, and see what demographics um uh, connect with uh, with what um with which channels because uh, you never know if you if you're relying on one particular it's not really connecting with that um, that group then you've got to move also, on and move to the next thing and also you mentioned how a certain number of people in the audience today uh, seem to run quite small companies and, mm -hmm. and those businesses 
are often reliant on one channel for their revenue. So maybe they, that they get most of their business from organic search or paid search. And whilst yeah. that's allowed them to grow their businesses, it makes them quite vulnerable to changes in algorithms and other things. And if at some point they're looking to get investment from anyone or sell their businesses, then if they're reliant too much on one channel, then that reduces the valuation. So there's broader, longer term kind of um, strategies here to make sure that you are spreading out your risk across multiple channels. And then that gives you more data to play with and more ways of optimizing yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So then we, we've got here, what, what, what can you do in, in terms of the basics? So um, you, you were talking to me about using the right analytics before. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an odd way for me to phrase it because most people use GA, right? Um, yeah. So, it's, so the, the, the question is almost, you know, if you're using GA, do you need to be using GA360? Um, and yeah. a lot of people won't know the difference. And if you're a small business and it's not particularly complex with limited traffic volumes, then GA, Google Analytics is fine as it is. But there's limitations to GA, for example, um, it'll only track about 10 million hits per month. And then mm -hmm. after that, number, it will start using sample data and dropping data because you haven't paid for more data to be collected. So right. if, you're, if, you're, if you're a big enterprise with loads and loads of traffic, then your data isn't particularly accurate if you're relying on just the free version of GA. Uh, there's also, I would say, and, and if you've got GA360, then there's different tiers, but I think tier one is something like 1 billion. So it's a, it's, it captures most people, I'd say, in that first yeah. tier bracket. Um, and then also part of that is if you're using GA, you can use about 20 custom metrics um, custom, or custom dimensions. And those are where you can kind of define different data buckets of things to collect. So it could be, for example, right. SEO score or product category. It's categories that you can define independent of what's out of the box in GA. Mm -hmm. And you're limited to 20 if you're on GA. With GA360, it, it, it's, about, it's about 200 if I remember. So again, it gives you more ways to cut your data, um, which yeah. you probably need, you've got more of it anyway. And also the, other, the last real difference is that the GA data is about 24 hours old, if not more. Um, right. You know, Whereas GA360, it's kind of refreshed four hours max. So if you need data, that's timely to make decisions, timely tactical decisions around things. Sure. GA360 gives you that, that immediacy. Yeah. I mean, on all of that just kind of leads into the, the, next, the next point you have on here, which is um, segmentation, which is, is, I always say is like a, a bare minimum for, for any marketer, really. If you're using digital marketing, um, segmentation and personalization is, is what you need to kind of cut through the noise and give people exactly what it is they're they're looking for. So um so that's 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 definitely a, a point that you need to you need to focus on and making sure you've got the right database to give you that um that segmentation. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and things have moved quite quickly on in this in that area of things. I mean, I remember back mm -hmm. in the day you'd sit down and you just kind of guess who your customers were, put them in a few buckets, call them personas, and pretend that you knew what you were doing. Um, and whereas now the data is there to kind of inform that whole process and there's yeah. stack technology that you can use um, from kind of newish pure play SaaS to big big enterprise that let you do that audience segmentation with some mm -hmm. degree of rigor and then there's obviously data management platforms that allow you to segment your audiences for the purposes of targeting your advertising more effectively then there's um, customer data platforms CDPs, which allow you to ingest all your customer data from multiple sources, create a single customer view, and then segment on that basis, which is kind of the way things are going and need to be going. Um, but most mm -hmm. people don't really do that. Most people have got their you know, the CRM, the standard CRM, which has got limited data in because all it is really yeah. capturing the basic customer transactional data. And then yeah. you best guess to segment. And I'm also seeing ma massive issues in terms of you know, some people have got you know, two segments, which I'm not sure how you can only have two segments. Um, and then other people have got that, that 200 different personas, at which point, what was the point categorizing things in the first place? If there's 200 things to work on. Um, yeah. So you look yeah. at, you know, between three and eight is probably kind of what you should be looking for. But I guess that hits on the, the last point here, which is giving, your, giving yourself enough time. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this sort of time issue again later, but giving yourself enough time to, to, to break down your data and, and give yourself a chance to actually communicate with the people in the right way. 
um, you know, making making data part of your culture. This, this is one of the, the great points I think that you used. I mean, I said yeah. at the beginning, I'm a bit of a data geek. It's you gotta you gotta have some sort of love for the data, right? Um, and make it part of the the company makeup. Yeah, and I will talk about on that a bit later. But yeah, that's that's definitely sure, what I need. It's, it's often easier said than done, right? Because I mean, depending on the size of your operation, you're gonna need that resource, that bandwidth. You know, that takes you away from BAU to mm -hmm. look at the data um you know it might mean that you don't actually have the skills in-house to to do any of it so you know, do you yeah. use an agent do you hire someone and then do you know what that what good looks like if you've not really yeah. managed that kind of operation before so you know it yeah. is easier said than done but you know it's the the only real area of competitive advantage people have right now beyond mm -hmm. scale is an understanding of their customer it comes yeah. down to that yeah Okay, well, that's a, a great segue. So it will lead into the first first poll. So we did ask you guys right before you joined the webinar when you when you um, when you signed up um, how well you know your customers. So after this first section, we want to know now how well you know your customers. Now it's a scale of one to five. One being you still don't know them at all, and five being yeah, you, you really know them. So uh, I'm going to launch this um, this poll and uh, let's get you guys to sort of fill this out. <clears throat> see what you're thinking. Okay. This is so, so high risk, Gavin. This is so high risk. It, 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 it is high risk. Nothing at all. Yeah, yeah. If we talk them nothing at all, um, then uh, then yeah. But we've got uh, most people are saying a three. So uh, so yeah, we, we've still got a few more people to to vote. I think most people are saying threes. We we've, we've got quite a few fours as well. Um, so most people on the fence at this point. Yeah, most people are on the fence. Come on, there's a couple more to, to vote if you haven't voted yet. Yeah. Okay. Some people being more honest now, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. A couple more maybe. No. Yeah. So it looks like we're we're pretty much on the fence here. So uh, there you go. Um, okay. Ch challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Yeah. So uh, so there's 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 the results. Um. Okay. So, so that's the first poll. We've got another two options or two tries for you guys on this one, so we'll get an idea. But most people are kind of on the fence in terms of how, how well they know their customers. But let's move through this. So we've gone through the basics now. Um, we'll try and speed this up a little bit. And um, we've got data science. And this is probably the, the, the key, the juicy bit, right? I, th I think so, because data science isn't a thing that, that most people do. And there's a few reasons for that. One reason mm -hmm. is that the, the term data scientist was only coined in 2008. So a lot yeah. of people uh, watching this webinar uh, wouldn't have learned it at school or college or when they were training or coming up through yeah. the ranks of businesses and whatnot. So it's quite a new area. Um, Which is probably why it scares some people as well, right? Yeah, I think so. And, and also, it sounds expensive, right? It sounds yeah. expensive. There's that too. <laughs> um, yeah. Particularly, particularly in this country, we're competing with the city and banks and things for data scientists. But let's mm -hmm. explain to you guys, kind of, you guys what it what it is and why it's so powerful. So what data science does is it's that key part of that customer insights piece we spoke about earlier, because it's that non-obvious um, insights that can be gleaned from your data. And in most mm -hmm. cases, it's not even the data scientist being asked to answer a question. It's a data scientist pulling together loads of data and seeing what the data can tell you in terms of connections and patterns and correlations and those types of things. So let's run through some examples to kind of bring it to life. The first one there, businesses use customer altitude data to save millions of pounds on their retention. Yeah. And so this is really interesting. Yeah. So this is from um, a, um, a supplier of ours whose customer did some, some work and it was a food delivery business. And they basically looked at all their data and the data suggested that, 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 that their customers that live above a certain altitude just did not churn. They were loyal through the thick and thin. Even if customer service had some problems, they would not leave. And the rationale was that if people lived above a, above a certain altitude and they were hard to get to, therefore more forgiving of poor service, more concerned about switching supplier because better the devil you know, perhaps. And mm -hmm. so what the business did is it just stopped spending money on retention marketing for customers who lived above a certain altitude. Yeah. And they did that and found that Whilst the retention budget worked for people below the altitude, 
above that altitude, if they didn't spend money trying to retain people, it made no difference at all. They still retained right. exactly the same number of customers and therefore saved literally tens of millions of pounds in annual retention budget just from having a little look at the data. Mm -hmm. right. I, I, I love that. I mean, the, the, well, I, I, we were looking at this before and I kind of asked you, you know, should you look, be looking at a radius in the same, in the same way? And your answer was, was, was no, not necessarily. This is where the data science comes into play because you're not necessarily looking for something. It's interrogating the data and the data telling you these, these as, things. As long as, you, as long as you've got the data in a central place, yeah, and it's, it's lots of data that you can grab from your own data from third party sources, then mm -hmm. the data science bit will find an answer in there for, for a yeah. question that you've asked even. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, could be, it could be that weather plays a role in something that you're doing. So don't mm -hmm. run such kinds of events when the weather's forecast is like this. Or so as long as the data's there, then the data science will take that huge amount of data and find relationships between things in ways that is almost like magic. It really is. It's yeah. sorcery. Amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so Bit of black magic. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So another example there: you know, the reading age of your product descriptions has a material impact on your bounce rates. And, yeah. You know, so the data you can pull in to a data science process is uh, an analysis of your pages and the characteristics of your pages, including some rec some standard mechanisms to determine what reading age requirement it is for those pages to be read properly, understood and comprehended. And mm -hmm. so for one of our clients, we found that there was a real strong correlation, which was 98.9 percent, which statistically means it's a fact, pretty much, that yeah. when, when their pages were more complex in terms of the reading age requirements than the equivalent pages on Amazon, their bounce rate was higher. And that kind right. of makes sense because if you don't really understand the description of the product, then you're mm -hmm. more reluctant to kind of convert and buy that thing in case it's not right or it's wrong or won't work if you plug it into your TV or isn't compatible sure. with X or Y. You have to also yeah. understand that the average reading age in the country is far, far lower than we think, because obviously we're a predefined group on this on this call right now. So we uh -huh. always assume that the reading is higher than it actually is. Yeah. So again, yeah, another thing that data science can dig up, which is you know, there's certain things that are affecting some of your key KPIs that you may never have dreamed would be the case. Yeah. I, I looked up because of this point. I looked up what um, the um, fairly uh, what fairly easy to to read is and what plain English is, what it's defined as, and it's, it's you know, easily understood. And it's um, basically the reading age of about 13 to 15 year old students and that kind of that kind of um you know makes it clear for people you know what what in which way you need to be writing to make sure something is completely clear and obvious um so i i, I do love that because it, it does it does make you think again about how you're you're sort of writing things and, and who you're writing for and then you yeah. then you layer in the segmentation bit too in that exactly. whole process personalization yeah. and suddenly you're building up a much bigger better picture of what you should and shouldn't be doing um, the yeah. one on the bottom left, new tire searches over index for men in homes with a pregnant woman because it's something tangible they feel they can control. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's one of those. Um, you yeah. know, you'll, hear, um, you'll, you'll hear the term over index and under index in data science all the time. It just basically mm -hmm. means that, you know, how, how does the data deviate from what the expected outcome is and then why yeah. that deviation occur? either over indexing or under indexing. So that's again, one that you wouldn't think is automatically kind of obvious, it's, it's clearly non-obvious. And you wouldn't ask a data scientist, go and check for me if our tires sell more to men with pregnant wives at home. So exactly. data has to but, if, but if you knew that, how would it change your marketing? So for example, now I've been to baby shows before, there's no tire supplier at a baby show. If I was a tire manufacturer, I'd try it. One show, choose one event, one baby show, and yeah. then basically have a stand at the baby show and see what happens. Yeah. But this, that's a, that's a part of testing, right? Which again, I know is a, a part we're going to come to. But that is a part of testing, and that's the sort of thing I, I love is 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 having a punt on something and giving it some some time to to actually work or not for you. But there you go. Correct. Um, the final one there. Hi. So this one was in in San Francisco. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure it was San Francisco. Let me just make sure I check, so I'm not lying to everybody. Yeah, yeah it's San Francisco. So yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. They found that. Areas with the most prostitution, alcohol, theft, and burglary were the most positive, positively correlated with Uber trips. 
Mm -hmm. That kind of makes sense, I guess, because you know, if people feel unsafe, they're more likely to use Uber. It might also be a financial thing. Those are more deprived areas. Maybe people don't have so much car ownership. I don't know. Or maybe transportation is not as good. Again, back to the Gavin's calling me on assumptions again. So don't, don't, don't know. I don't know. But, but that is what's been found over and over again uh, in certain um, models for, for Uber. Uh, and that's useful because for multiple reasons, I guess, if you were Uber, Maybe your advertising mm -hmm. in those areas should be different or more. Uh, do you use out yeah. advertising? Do you create a segment which is actually people that live in more deprived areas, for instance, as a separate segment which you approach differently with different messaging? If you're a competitor, yeah. Uber, that's really powerful to know. Um, that actually don't launch in don't launch in Notting Hill, launch somewhere else, for instance, or the equivalent of America. Um, there you go. Again, it's these insights that you wouldn't ordinarily think. They're non-obvious and data science really is the only way of surfacing some kind of some some assumptions that have the backing of data which are then worth yeah. testing you can't test everything you can't just ask a random person in the pub what they think and then go and test that it's, it's, it's yeah. impossible to resource that yeah you need, you that. need a, a bigger sample right correct yeah okay so in terms of what you can do um uh we were talking you talk about having a data scientist and yeah. I mean, the assumption is that it's going to be expensive. Um, yeah, but, uh, the data scientists are a skill that are in high demand, so they are expensive people to to, to get in. The mm -hmm. but, but why I'm saying that basic data science is expensive is for a few reasons. The first reason is that you all, pretty much all of you, have Google Analytics, and as a data source, that's good enough as an input into data scientists platforms to do some really basic um, routine analysis and it's the same analysis that they'll, that they'll do with for, for hundreds of businesses so they're not rebuilding a, a a platform in most cases to test certain things they've already built those things so if it's a case yeah. of them plugging into your GA and then doing a quick run through and saying here are the basic things that we found based on what your data is telling us that's not a big job I mean they can do that in half a day if that. Now, sure. it's also the case that you have now lots of agencies that employ data scientists like I do, or data science specialist agencies. So it's not even a case of you needing to go and hire a data scientist on the full-time payroll. You can just dip in and use data scientists that an agency has for a few hours, half a day. And the great thing about that is that won't be that expensive. It will drive some really good insights, more often than not, which then you can test, which becomes a bit a really good business case but going and asking for more budget to do some more. Right, so that, exactly. You know, yeah. If you've never done it before, ha have, a, have a go. It won't be that expensive to try. Uh, yeah, and then so. make, sure you follow, make sure you follow it through in terms of taking that assumption, testing it properly, measuring it properly, and then being able to have a closed loop project to say, we, did, we spent this amount, amount of money, we found out this, we tested this, it moved X, Y KPIs by X percent, we made an extra X million pounds. So as yeah. long as you fit it through properly, then it's, yeah. it's a really easy way to start. One of the key things here, and, and, and it's one thing that I, I tend to find with clients is, is sort of gauging um, the value of something, so working out actual ROI. Um, and I've, I've, I've found this as well with sort of um, calculating value of an email address. You know, you start to, I start to recommend bits and pieces they can do with their email um, and, you know, changes they can make in the channel, uh, but it calculating exactly how, um, um, how this has made a difference and whether or not we should keep going with that. So and I, I yeah. think this is great. You're, you're saying that we should test things out and, you know, get a, a data science uh, scientist in and sort of dip your toe and try things out. But you've got to make sure that you can work out exactly where where you've got uplift and calculating basic uh, basically changes for these. Um, it, goes back to these our opening it goes back to our opening, opening slides about getting the basics right. Are you spending exactly. enough time in your analytics so you know that it's exactly. actually exactly. Yeah. things? It's actually Probably. making a difference. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and and a good way of doing that is you know, have a have a mini project about you know building some MI and BI dashboards that go up to board level. Um, you know, because if you can build a BI dashboard that says some interesting things, then you've probably mm -hmm. got enough knowledge in house to do GA um, to some degree of justice. If you struggle yeah. to even out to your point, basic ROI calculations by segments and things, then you need some help. But the, so the basics yeah. need. So you're, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, yeah, and then and then just sort of quickly on the on the data lake. 
um, pulling everything together into one central place? Yeah, so basically, if you're, if you're going to um, do data science properly, then you need to start putting all your data in a central place beyond just CRM data. Uh, okay, and that so you can you have an Excel spreadsheet as well, right? Yeah, certainly true. Certainly true. And I think, um, and I'm not saying people should go out tomorrow morning and you know build an entire data lake, pulling in you know, millions and millions of points of data, but start thinking yeah. about where your data lives, how you can pull it into a central point, and just yeah. and not even for the purpose of data science initially, just for the purpose of kind of illustrating trends and things, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of that can be done through you know, customer data platforms that are increasingly. Um, you know, not that expensive to run but again you can build your own quite easily from a basic level but i think just getting to that process mm. of where's our data what other data could we pull in from various sources pull that into a central uh, place because at some point you might be ready to really interrogate bigger data sets and having a culture which thinks about where your data lives how it can be pulled in and where can it be centrally stored is i think mm. really, really important um because it, it's yeah. it's a future of insights it's the future of everything yeah, I know that. I mean, look, it's a journey you're going to be going on, right? And you've got to dip your toe in, as I keep saying, at some place and, and make your way up the journey till you get to the point of maybe a, 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 a CDP or DMP. Um, and I've seen, I wouldn't necessarily advise it as a long term strategy, but I've seen people use our platform, you know, um, Engagement Cloud, to sort of store all the data in one place, get an idea of where you are, then move to the next stage. Because um, yeah. you know you can you can segment and personalise and bits and pieces all in one place, but it's good if you've got that um, that um, sort of single single central place to to view everything uh, and get an idea of where you where you where you stand. Um, yeah. Let's let's kind of jump on here and see again. We've got an, another poll. Um, same question again, so so not difficult for you people. Um, but we've got another poll here asking you now again how well. You think you know your customers after these these two um, stages we've been through. So again, it's uh, on a on a one to five scale. Um, so after we've we've talked about how you can have uh, data scientists come in and help you, um, you know, really unearth those bits and pieces in your database that you know nothing about. You know, do you think you know your customers now? Um, we're, we're swinging. We're swinging here. It looks it looks as though people are people think they understand their customers more um which is interesting you know maybe maybe they they're, they're using these uh these uh pieces and, and tools that we're talking about um and this is why they think they know their data more but it looks like people think they know their data or their, their customers i should say so uh maybe a couple more to, to answer no yeah all right, so it's 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 swung here a little bit. So we uh, we finished the last one with people uh, on a three, but now um, it seems that people uh, are on a four here. They 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 seem like they know their data more after we're going through all of this. I don't know. Is that is that is that is that what the the way we want this to go? <laughs> well, it, I think it, it is what it is. But I mean, I mean, it, our our purpose here is to challenge people to think about it. Uh, yeah, they do ordinarily, and if they're thought about it and actually they're doing all these things, then, then mm -hmm. great. But you do have in that data, was it a good 17% of people that kind of scored at one? So I mean, it's that's yeah. people that have a, have a long way to go, right? Yeah, right. Okay, so we've done the basics, data science, and and here is the crux, and and this is the part that I, I sort of love because um, a lot of the time it seems like a cop out when people say right i've got um, i've got this idea do you think that's going to work gas <laughs> i come back to them and say T test it um and it seems like a cop out but really it's it's not at all um it's what you need to be doing testing should be uh should be part of the culture for for everything everything you do we should all be testing so um there's some there's some really sort of key points here to, to pull up and we'll go through this um this area and then we'll open up to questions I see there's a couple of questions that have come through already. We'll we'll get around to those. Um, cool. But yeah, testing. Yeah, so, so I, I always say that marketing is a floating point on a moving target because you know it's never done. It's always a work in progress, and things always shift and move. That means that you have yeah. to always be willing to shift and move. And so testing yeah. is really important. There's some examples in the bottom here that we'll go through just to give people an idea of the kind of tests that you know are basic standard things and to sort of provoke mm -hmm. some idea of when they should be testing things more or not. First one there, there's often a 40% drop off in form completion due to making the phone number field mandatory. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people kind of know that 
making certain fields mandatory is a bad thing, but it has a 40% drop. I mean, it, do the calculation in terms of revenue loss from that. Um, and again, yeah. basic things that you can test really, really easily. Second one there, studies show that customers were able to complete single form, single column forms up to 500% faster than multi-column forms. Again, really mm -hmm. basic things, but again, it, it, the, the kinds of things that make a big, big, massive difference. Um, people yeah. click through the page slider 32 times out of 500 visits, a 0.65% click-through rate. So home, home page sliders are bad, um, categorically yeah. bad. And then you go through you know, um, WordPress templates and things, and they've all got these home page sliders. They don't yeah. work. Uh, yeah. Again, what kind of things have you assumed must be good best practice? Because you see, if WordPress has got a template, then surely it's a good thing, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm glad you said that because it's one of those things, again, I always say to people, you know, we talk about best practice, but best practice is only best practice if it works for you. And the yeah. only way you're going to figure out if it works for you is by, by testing these things out and, and listening to, to these sorts of um, these sorts of comments, too, because it could be the case that um, in your field, you know, having a having a phone number field um, could work. But right. you need to you need to test these things out, right? Correct. Correct. Um, which is this this this, uh, this quote here is 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 great because um, it kind of highlights everything, right? Why isn't yeah. everyone testing? Yeah, yeah. So here's when we ask the survey again, and everyone says that they you know, uh, know their customer really really well. Um, a a bit a, a bigger um, bigger sample set. Forty five percent of companies aren't conducting any UX tests. At yeah. which point, even if these companies are doing all the things that we've spoken about today in terms of the basics. And data science if they're not conducting regular ux tests or, or any at all then they're completely wasting their time so again yeah. this is why people on the call today clearly are not the average out there because the average is far far worse than people that we're talking to today yeah one of the things i picked out as well is you know kind of why people aren't testing and it, it could be and again this isn't like an assumption but it could be that people don't have the right tech to test um because i've seen that only 44 percent of um of, of these people are testing are using software to test so they're kind of just leaving up to uh, sort of manual testing which again yeah. is going to make things a lot harder right so you've got I, to I have this, the tools to help you test i think there is that there's also you know bandwidth and resources internally to do things that are considered to be kind of extra things as opposed yeah. to you know, ensure the lights are kept on uh, and customers are kept happy sure. so there's that, there's that kind of issue too but also conversely some of the businesses who are far far bigger definitely have the budget, but because they operate in massive complex organizations, running a UX test might, might require seven lines of sign off, right? Yeah. It's going to be a lot harder. And then also the implications of getting something wrong could be millions and millions of pounds of lost revenue. So I can but see that, how polit politics as well as technology often yeah. conspire to make people not as, a, as proactive here as they need to be. But I think that's what I mean, we can probably move on to this, but I think that's probably where having a good culture for testing comes into place so that, I mean, for me, the reason why you test is so you don't have those huge mistakes and a proper testing environment would mean, you know, you have sample sets of data so that it's not going to have that, that huge impact on the bottom line that you can continue to run the, uh, the control, uh, which is working for you, but testing out on a smaller subset of data to understand yeah. exactly what is um, or isn't working for you. I think this is this is the, the whole sort of thing we've been talking about is if you've got a culture of testing within the company, I think um, that can sort of grow with you to uh, to adding in, um, you know, larger pieces of testing to larger areas, maybe to your website, et cetera, um, yeah. uh, over and above just maybe um, testing on uh, a subject line, which will, you know, if you test out a subject line or something, it is going to, um, you know, give you better open rates and drive more people through to your website. So you've got to, you've got to um, sort of weigh up the, um, the end results of having um, some sort of key testing on, on what it is you're doing across your, your, your digital setup. Yeah, and, 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 you're, and you're right. Having testing as part of your DNA is really important. And, and we've spoken mm. before about how, um, you know, the Americans are much better at this than we are because particularly on kind of the, 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 the West Coast, they've got this, thing about you know, doing lots and lots of tests, fail fast, um, and if you do enough tests, then it will net out positive, as opposed to you know, being more uh, more apprehensive about it, doing one test that fails, and then everyone's burned and scarred for all time. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. and so you're right, having the right process, which means that you control the impact so that it doesn't you know, hurt the, hurt an entire site if you've gone the wrong way. But doing enough mm -hmm. tests lets a net out. Um, you know, is that is that is that great quote? Uh, I can't remember who quoted it. Someone will tell, tell us, I'm sure. You know, that you miss 100% of the shots that you take. You don't take. Yeah. You don't and take. That, yeah. Yeah. There's there's clearly clearly some truth in that. Um, yeah. But you're right. You look at the the, the, the the first bullet there in terms of technology. It can be quite difficult to work out what's best for you to use. I mean, you've got, for instance, uh, you know, the, 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 the Google stack has you know, A-B testing capabilities and these types of things with optimized and optimized 360. But they mm -hmm. can be, in my experience at least, quite complicated and quite um, traumatic for a business to take on wholeheartedly because it requires at least some degree of development skill. Um, sure. But then there are other options that people may not be aware of. You know, there's you know, optimized leads, BWO, which are really good. Yep. Yep. Simpler systems perhaps don't have the have the extensive ability to be you know, to tailor and bespoke things in the same way as being part of Google Stack. But in terms of getting things off the ground and testing things quite quickly in an environment that's easy to understand and is built that way, built to be easy to understand, there's loads of options. And again, it doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, there are lots of packages that allow you to entry level into the space yeah. and conduct these tests yeah. have the data in the right place so you can view it in one place so, so it becomes less about opinion and more about fact exactly yeah i mean that, that one of the things for for our platform as well is you know simple a b spit testing if you get a culture built up uh, around that the simple things then you can start to spread out and, and you know branch out to, to other areas but there's there's two points on here and i made sure i put these on here uh because because you mentioned them and i thought that the, the sort of brilliant is is be patient and being brave and i think patient yeah. is, a, is a key here with testing it's there's a there's a culture of failing fast which you mentioned and it's something that i said before but you've also got to give the test long enough to uh to give you uh to give you the result you know you can't just um as you said before ask one person in a bar what they think of something and Correct. if they give you the wrong answer, it's like, okay, there you go. That's my test done. Correct. And, and part of it's basic psychology, right? So let's say you've got you know, the, the majority of visitors to your website, are, in most cases, are going to be repeat visitors. People that have come to the yeah. site over and over again. And people being creatures of habit don't like change. So you might change mm -hmm. something and then suddenly all your repeat visitors can't find things because they're used to finding it in a particular way, often exactly. circumventing often circumventing actually problems with the site to find them, but they've got used to doing that even. So yeah. their experience becomes worse because they're having to yeah. relearn things. And then often your KPIs drop um, in terms of conversion rates, KPIs. And then they, when they bounce back again though with familiarity, then they go and then exceed. So you've got to give yeah. tests some, some, some time. And the, yeah. the worst thing is, is to not hold your nerve long enough to see a test through because exactly. then you've ruined all your chances of it bouncing back and then but as long yeah. as you've done, as long as the testing procedure is well thought out, well structured, you're using really good data to try and inform a hypothesis, um, you know, you're using other examples of experience and things like that, then you should be able to comfortably hold your nerve and trust yourself that what you're doing is going to have either the right outcome or you're going to learn um, loads for the next go round. Ho hopefully, I mean, it, yeah. it's having a. I think having a good team around you is 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 part and parcel of that too. So internally, yes, but also if you've got agencies, you're speaking to like ourselves or you guys, um, yeah. we'll we'll probably we'll probably um, you know hold your hand and say no, wait, wait, well, let's, let's let's test it it's out a little bit longer. Yeah, so one of the yeah, having a one, team around you. Yeah, and one of the benefits of an agency is that uh, agencies will typically have a, a, a greater breadth of experience across lots of clients. They might have, they may yeah. have seen something like. Um, you know, for other clients and they know kind of how long things typically take so they'll have more informed view of how long something might take before it bounces back and then kind of redeems itself and then some um yeah. and, that, and you mentioned it already kind of the be brave bit and you know, being brave doesn't mean being reckless though um and you know, being brave means, you know having the courage to want to improve things and make a difference and move things forward um mm -hmm. being, being being brave to not accept that a one percent year-on-year year growth in your kpis is good enough um, but again, it doesn't mean being reckless. You have to do the legwork. Yeah. You need to make sure that you're doing things properly, sensibly, that you understand the risks, that you're managing and mitigating any risks as part of this kind of process. Yeah. Okay. What I want to do now is um, is do the, the final poll and see if uh, if people's um, minds have been changed, if they're thinking in slightly different ways. So again, same question again, guys. 
One being um, you don't know your customers at all. Five being you know your customers inside out. So last time uh, to answer this poll, um, oh, it, it jumped up straight away. A lot of people were on a on a two. Um, all ones, they're in there. Keep going. There's about half of you that uh, that have voted so far. So we'll see. It's interesting the split here. No one's on the fence anymore. They're either either quite high up or they're they're pretty low down. Interesting. And I think um, yeah. So a couple more seconds. Let you uh, let you vote. Okay. I think we'll I think we'll close it there. Um, we'll see where you are. And th this is really interesting. Yeah. So it swung all the way through. I think when it comes through to testing, because this is what we talk about at each stage, we have thrown people, but it comes through to testing. I think people have um, have, have thought they don't know their, their customers as, as much as they said before. So it's it's a it's a split. It's a split. But there we go. Um, right. Okay. So I think we've got a, a couple of minutes to to run through some uh, some questions. Um, first off, we've got a question that is. And I'm not sure where where they're looking at. It's probably on on site, but they said, um, "What percentage is a bad bounce rate?" Um, is that? Ooh. I think this is this this That's is a this is a a tough one, right? That, that, it, it's a tough one, but the, and the answer is not an answer that person's going to be looking for because bounce rates are really, really bad KPI. And it's really bad yeah. KPI for a particular reason because let's let's take let's say that I'm running a website and I want to. Um, and basically just do the best I can with my existing customers who have all heard from me from word of mouth and from the usual channels, loads of them are repeat customers as well. My bounce rate is really, really good, really, really healthy. Now then, if I then decide to be really proactive and spend more on marketing and get more new customers in, my bounce rate spikes up because mm -hmm. I'm bringing different types of people. So often a bounce rate staying the same or improving is a bad thing because it means you're not pushing boundaries you're not trying to grow the business yeah yep. so it's difficult to say whether a particular bounce rate because it's good or bad depending on what context you're at are your business that is actively trying to grow are your business that's just trying to nurture a mature audience already um but there's also factors around what well, what's a what what's good for you i mean is it a case of um you know bounce rates on particular parts of the site are not as important as, as other ones are these yeah. bounces costing you money or not costing you money uh, in terms of that's are they it. coming organically or are you paying for them to come in at which point that's very different if traffic's coming in for free and therefore it's of a broad range of relevancy and it's bouncing you can't really control that because these are people that are coming in who weren't meant to be your customers anyway because maybe your price point's completely different or you don't really sell what they think you sell as opposed yeah. to the opposite so so unfortunately there's no there's no answer to that because it isn't a kind of a it isn't an objective metric of what's good and bad as a percentage. It does depend on what you're trying to achieve, whether you're growing, whether you're staying clean, and those types of things. I think here the best answer for this. Um, I mean, later on we're going to leave our uh, our email addresses so you can um, reach out to us. But I think um, who answer who asked this question, you should probably get in touch with us, and we can see your specific um, sort of scenario and help you through that. Because it also um, it is also sector specific. So you know exactly exactly so, yeah. So someone's conversion rate in a grocery business compared to someone's bounce rate in a um, electronic retailers makes that, that comparison. Yeah. But maybe we can help Gavin in terms of what's best in class bounce rate and what the range is within sectors exactly. that we know. Yeah. 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 Um, right. Because of, cause of, of, of time, you know, sort of five minutes left. Uh, there are two questions here that I think we can maybe fuse together or something. Um, it's. It's a question about uh, what if you're on a shoestring budget, you know, um, how can we get started on this? Because, again, I think it's because, uh, you know, scared of uh, the, the, the word data science uh, or yeah. data scientists. And the other one is, is there a difference? And I love this. Is there a difference between B2B um, and B2C? Um, and this has been something that's bugged me for, for a long time. But, but yeah, if, if we could kind of fuse those two together and, and, and answer those. Um, in quick succession, I think that would be great. So the first one was um, I mean? if you're on a shoestring budget. Okay. Um, so look, a shoestring budget's fine, and, and lots of people are going to be in that position. What you need to do is start from the beginning of this presentation and get the basics right, because the yeah, basic exactly. 
whether you're on a shoestring budget or not, you need to be counting stuff and counting stuff properly. There's no excuse for that. I don't care how small you are or how, how little money you've got. If it means you going in and watching 4,000 YouTube videos about how you make a GA accurate. Um, yeah. so, so, so even if that's the case, you start at the basics um, and you, know, you don't need to yeah. do everything on day one. You just need to be better every month, incrementally better each month. Exactly, you do, exactly. Is you focus on the basics because the basics are yeah. largely free. The basics are largely free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And the other thing is as well, um, do not assume that something is too expensive for you. And it's all relative, right? Um, so as you said, you know, a couple of days a week with a data scientist, uh, to give you um, something to uh, to implement and test out, that can have a huge effect, which means that you'll be able to afford it uh, later on down the line. So don't assume that. Um, and the other question there was about the B2B, B2C difference. Is there any difference between the two? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think there is. I mean, I think most of us that have worked in both, I think controversially would probably say that B2B is a lot tougher. It's brutal um, based on, you know, Selling a can of Coke is a lot more easy than selling a multi-billion pound um, kind of um, technological implementation. But then I think part yeah. of this is part of this question is that B two B is a problem as a term in of itself because it catches too many companies. So are we talking about B two B businesses like mine and yours, Gavin? Are we talking about B two B businesses like uh, massive law firms? Are we talking about B two B in terms of SaaS businesses with three employees but four thousand um, users? Right. Yeah. And so. Does the, so, the, so the key thing actually isn't to get hung up on the B2B, B2C bit, but actually tailor a solution for you based on the specifics exactly. of your dynamics within your business. Um, yeah. One key, one key thing typically is though that with B2B, you typically need to generate more trust in the customer. Um, mm -hmm. because, you know, if you're buying something, if you're buying an FMCG product, then you're not locked in to that product for two, three, four years, and you hire an agency or you pay for an annual license for a product or whatever it might be, you're locked in for a longer period of time. It's not as if yeah. you're buying, it's not as if you go and buy you know, Pepsi's new flavor and don't like it, but tough luck, you're drinking it now for the next three years. So with B2B, you're often more locked in with B2B. So the trust is a bigger factor. And then that also then leads to offline being a bigger factor too, in terms of generation yeah. relationships and rapport yeah. uh, and that's where email comes in as part of that massively uh, yeah. And those types. yeah i think i think that's 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 great because i mean you do again back to where we started you do need a number of channels to to make everything work and i think relying on putting yourself into a, a particular bucket b2b or b2c is is going to make things too hard what you need to be doing is working out what tactics are best for you and i think um, that's what i try to hammer home to to any client I speak to is don't don't just assume that you fall into a particular bracket and there is a particular set of rules you need to follow. It's what's going to work for you. And we've been talking about it all day, testing out, you know, finding some um, some bits and pieces within your data set which gives you a competitive advantage over those people in your vertical is what's gonna is gonna make you win. Um, great. I think um, I think that's it. We've uh, we've kind of covered everything off. Um, thanks for everyone joining in. Um, if there, there are some questions here, additional questions, we'll, we'll try and get back to you directly. Or if you want to ask us directly, our email addresses are here. We're happy for you to, to send us a, a few uh, a few questions, and, and we'll get the we'll get those uh, sort of back to you um, answered. Um, and if there's anything else really you want to go into, uh, feel free to, to reach us uh, reach out to us. Um, if you're if you're a data geek or not, or if you uh, if you think you know your 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 customers inside out or not, um, get in touch with us and we can we can help you dive deeper into your, into your data. Um, but thanks, Andres, for for joining us today. It's really insightful stuff. I really enjoyed it. Um, and thanks for everyone who's uh, who's who's tuned in. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.